today Rick's topic is, I can't believe you said that, why couples fight, and why this lecture probably won't help. <laughs> so, Rick up. Thank you for doing whatever it took to get here today. Um, I know what I dealt, dealt with in terms of traffic, and so if you had any of that going on, or whatever you did this morning to get here, I really appreciate that. And for anyone who's watching, thanks for taking the time to watch. So, here you are, you're at a lecture that says that it probably won't help, so I want to see, um, basically, by a show of hands, how many have the ability to raise their hand? <laughs> okay, of, of those people, hold your hands up if you wouldn't mind. Of those people, how many of you are therapists who are or working with couples or want to work with couples? Like you're actually in the healing field. Okay, good. We got a good, a good group of healers here. That will help me fine tune what I'm about to say because I'm going to go fast. I only have about an hour to cover probably weeks of work, and I hope to just inspire you. Like I said, maybe my lecture won't help, but it might guide you to the places that will help. Let's see if this clicker works. There we go. So we know why you're here. So my number one hope today is to give you an idea of just how automatic our brains are. That's something, I've been at this for at least seven years. I've always been curious about psychology, but I really put my mind to it and went into a master's program about seven years ago. And it's just about in this year that I realized, wow, our brains are so unconscious. And I'm surprised by mine almost all the time. So if you haven't seen this, this is one of the things I'd say, hey, if my lecture doesn't help, this might. You can go check this out on the internet. It goes into the details of what the mind structure is and why there's so much that's automatic. It has to do with us having to push away novelty, things that are new to make room to keep being able to be in touch with our environment, and they'll say more about that. The second hope is that since most of what we do is automatic, I'd like for you to start to get this idea that very often partners underestimate how threatening they are just showing up in life. Um, I could be doing this to you, hey, you know, it's a beautiful day outside, isn't it? And your brain will be hearing the words, but you're also probably picking up these gestures as somehow threatening. And if that was threatening, I'd like to take a moment and have us all regulate and feel your feet on the floor and notice the silence. So there's all sorts of things that we do that are automatic that's threatening. And as a, yes. Oh, yeah, thanks for reminding me, Tom. Sorry about that. We have a mic up here, and they want me to be well mic. Well done. Um, so now I'm going to use the right side of my brain because it's on the left side. Okay. So that automatic behavior can walk people into fights without them even knowing it. And so the third hope I have today is if we can get our clients to be curious about what their automatic brains are doing, we can guide them to doing something a little different or a lot different in terms of secure functioning. Now what I'll be doing today is talking a lot about secure functioning. I was introduced to that by a gentleman by, uh, by the name of Stan Tatkin, Dr. Stan Tatkin. How many have heard of Dr. Stan Tatkin? Oh good, good, good. So this might seem a little redundant if you followed his work, but for the hands that didn't go up, I think you're in for a treat. So here's what we're going to run into. Getting people to be curious about their brain. Did someone see? Did I hear someone ask a question? No, oh, I thought I heard a voice. Um, getting people to be curious about their brain can be challenging. So here's where we're headed today. I want to start off with three domains, if you will, of what's important to know when you're working with couples. The first is the neuroscience. Basically, how's our brain wired and why does it do its thing? Second of all is how did it get wired? And usually a lot of that has to do with how we were attached with or how we were seen as children. And then arousal. That would be what do you do when someone's brain is heated up and doing something that could be considered um, in, outside of a window of tolerance, which would be they're getting ready to fight, flight, or freeze. Because we're going to need to know that and set an example for our clients. So why am I here? Why did I become a therapist? Why do I like talking about this? Because I had great experiences in my own therapy. And my own therapy mostly consisted from top down. We'd sit there and we'd talk about stuff. Hey, you know, how do you feel about that? But it wasn't really asking how do you feel about it. It was more like what's your opinion on it? What's your thought about it? And there's a huge revolution. I'm, maybe, maybe you folks are noticing this, that people are really starting to use the body more, which would be called bottom-up therapy. We're using senses in ourselves. It's called introception. Another guy named Dan Siegel, I love following, talks about how we 
perceive what's going on inside of us, and that has to do with a part of the brain called the insula, I believe. So I've also done a lot of healing in my primary relationship. I should say relationships, but right now I'm in a primary relationship, and it's rocking because of some of the, if not all, of the techniques that I've been able to pick up in the last, say, year, year and a half of studying this stuff. So attachment theory really is helpful. I encourage you guys to get to know it if you don't know it already. Have anyone heard of attachment theory? <laughs> okay, good. If you don't, check it out. It's definitely worth checking out. Um, I took a lot of training. It got me going like, oh, wow, there's got to be more to learn. And I took a lot of training, 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 and I took a lot of training. I think I spent more on training than I did on my master's program. Oh, but no. two things surfaced in all that training. Something resonated, and I bet you guys have all had that experience where you say, wow, this kind of speaks to me. And that was the PACT model, the psychobiological. It's also now called the psychoneurobiological approach to couples therapy and somatic experiencing from, um, and I'll show you who it's from. So I've been inspired a lot of people. Here's Alexander Katahakis. Oh, I'm so fortunate to be able to work with here in the Center for Healthy Sex. And she is running around with all these other inspirations in my mind. <laughs> and um, I was trying to do a little Brady Bunch theme, but I couldn't quite get it. But again, I want to talk mostly about what this gentleman has introduced to the field of couples work. Because both these guys are focusing on using a bottom-up approach, knowing what our system is doing at the time, all the time, and teaching couples to start checking that out. So let's start with this section, neuroscience. Our primitive brain structures run the show automatically. Let me bring this out. I always carry this with me so I don't lose my mind. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here every Friday. So I'll show a diagram a little better than this, but think of this. This is a three, roughly a three-pound piece of meat that uses anywhere from 20 five to forty percent of our calories so it's doing a lot of stuff and what I'd like to do is just drop into that really quick the inner part of our brain if you imagine if you start here let me borrow your hands again go up, go like that please this is Dan Siegel's brain hand model you may have heard of it but think of this as your spinal column and then you bring this thumb over this would be for very simplistic reasons called the amygdala it's a threat detection center that's very close to the brainstem. It's constantly at the ready to tell us whether we should run, fight, or freeze. Wrap your hand around it, and then you consider that's like the majority of our brain matter, figure about 90%, and then take this other hand, and let's call that the neocortex. Thanks for playing along, really having fun. This neocortex is where all consciousness is. Now think about it, it's like 10%. That means that we're thinking a lot, but we're not actually affecting our actions as much as we'd like to. We'd like to think we're all in control, but I'm going to experiment a little with you to see how basically in control you can be when this part of your brain wants to do something that this guy's not wanting to do. In other words, this part of your brain will tell you to do things all the time without your permission, and permission comes from consciousness. So I see a lot of heads nodding. I hope I'm not being redundant. So this part of our brain, this amygdala, got really fine-tuned. You figure from some of the fossil records about 1.9 million years ago, I wasn't born then, about 1.9 million years ago, we had to figure out how to survive things like that. And I'm on the wrong side again, let's go here. The thing that we also had to survive the most was other people walking, or I guess the hominids, um, walking on legs, getting upright, cooking food now. Now we're able to cook our food and be able to ingest enough calories for this huge energy consuming device in our head. We figure that that's what took us out of the trees, that now instead of spending eight hours a day chewing on leaves, we could cook our food and ingest enough calories and then the neurons took off. Last estimate, we have 80, 86 billion neurons. Here's another reference for you, Susan Herculano, Dr. Susan Herculano has figured out roughly how many neurons we have and it's pretty cool how she did it. There's a great TED talk on it. But you can just see this acceleration in skull size as we learn to ingest our food that was pre-digested with heat and fire. But check this out. I mean, just notice what you might feel in your body now. Imagining if we parachuted you into this situation right now, can you feel like, God, this might be kind of tricky to manage? <laughs> and you'd have to be fast and able to get out of harm's way. 
So the number one thing that our brain wants us to do all the time is not get killed. Think of that when you're working with couples because I'm going to get to the third section of that slide and talking about how powerful primary attachment is. That activates the part of our brain that's checking, are we going to get killed? Are we going to get killed? Because we do not want to get killed. So we have this automatic nervous system that wants to stay away from threat, and yet we need to attach and bond to survive. Because you, if, you saw, if you saw someone, God forbid, leave a baby somewhere in the park or in the forest, wouldn't we all just kind of like, whoa, what's up with that? That baby's not going to survive. We've got to do something about it. Unlike other creatures that, you know, after a few weeks, they're running around getting their own food. We take a very long time. So we're dyadic creatures for a reason. We're inclined to make pairings. There are biological as well as psychological reasons for pairing. And much of our environment has changed since prehistoric times, but our threat detection circuits have not changed much. And I'm going to whip through this pretty quick. I don't, this is stuff that I think as therapists we ought to know if it's interesting, and if not, just know that your threat detection, your limbic system, is down here. And just the, there's like a one millimeter later of the cerebral cortex, which is all the thinking and high processing expensive systems are. So it doesn't stand a chance when we're under threat. Oh, here's an example. I forgot to put that slide in. So the smart relational parts come from here. This is the outer layer. And specifically, in this last part of our brain to be developed, the, the prefrontal cortex. But notice. It's, it's complex based on the density, that's the gray matter. This is fast and dumb. This is slow and smart. This takes very little resources, very little oxygen and glucose. This takes a lot. This is very expensive. And you may actually notice that when you're trying to learn something, you actually feel some sort of a mental sensation. That sometimes it's hard. It takes work to use our brains. That sensation is usually coming from the prefrontal cortex trying to manage things. Whereas this stuff so automatic. Keep that in mind, because that's going to be running the show with your couples. Stan Tatton calls them primitives. It's cute. It works. I mean, it's a, think of that, part of the brain versus the ambassadors. The, the primitives come in. They shoot first, ask questions later, as he would say. And then when the spell is over, when the adrenaline and the cortisol gets out of our system and oxygen and glucose return to the ambassadors, they have to come in and clean everything up. And they look around and wonder why everybody's dead. Well, it's because the primitive shot everybody. Like, ah. So that's one thing I want you to keep in mind when working with couples. So I'm going to give you a little demonstration. I want you to think back to a time when you were very young and recall something that occurred that was frightening and or humiliating. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this ball to one of you and I want you, as soon as you catch it, to stand up and tell everybody what happened. <laughs> ah. Okay, let me be, have mercy on your nervous systems. I'm not really going to do that, but notice what just happened. I'm just using words, words vibrating air across your eardrums, symbols, objects in your mind conjured up. And all of a sudden, hopefully some of you, I heard some nervous laughter, I'll call it, I said, wow, am I really, might, I might have to catch that ball and say something. So that's just a perfect example of your automatic brain cooking off for reasons of perhaps protection in here. Maybe this isn't the right environment for you to confess what hurt long ago. So it's helpful to understand the automatic brain. So this is what we've just gone through. Now let's hit attachment. Our early life, survival depends on caregivers for several years. How our caregivers attuned to our need for security shapes our limbic system over those developmental years. And primary adult relationships that are threatening activate limbic reflexes. Think of that as a reflex. Think of this automatic brain. This is where our pain reflex is. Shoot first, ask questions later. So if you have an environment where your wiring is set up by the people that took care of you in the first 18 months of life that wasn't responsive, that was somehow stressful, your brain starts to say, hey, maybe that's what love is supposed to feel like, or maybe this is what I need to protect myself against. Have you guys seen the still phase experiment? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, this is going to be fun too. So I'm going to, also actually, I'm gonna say, let me give you a little precursor here. Brace yourself, because I think we're all carrying people here, because, or we've taken on this profession for a variety of reasons, but I project that it's mostly because we care about others. We're going to see something that's going to be momentarily distressful, 
but if you can get through that, I think the bigger message would be very important. That is how automatic, even in early, develop, in early development, we are. Let's go back to that. I have to click to start. Hmm. We'll get it. So notice your activation pattern starting. I've got the computer and presenter mode so it doesn't do its thing automatically. Sorry about the delay. Just notice what your body's doing. Because that's your brain running the show. Here we go. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago, when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In think how young his story, brain is. Mother did, think how early this is. And she's playing with her baby, who's about a year of age. I like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world, and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother. Feel what's going on in your chest points. right now. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on. Why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get only two a minutes. reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's almost over. There we go. He's back. She's back, excuse me, it's a she. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So thanks for bearing with me. But think of all that going on, and now I want you to see or think of any couples that you've worked with or maybe your own relationships where there's some sort of underlying message that I won't be there for you. And that is the same part of the brain, alive and well, and no matter how old we are, I'm going to argue, and with good evidence internally and maybe for you guys to find out for yourselves, that we never outlive the need to be parented, and we're primarily dyadic creatures. So if you look at the bell-shaped curve, most people feel better in life when they're tethered to someone. And it starts very early because of that. We're set up to want to be in some sort of connection with someone that says, hey, when I am in distress, I can get you to respond to me. And that's one of the things I see sadly with couples is they don't know how to take care of each other. So 
let me see if I can run the show again from the place that I was. Anybody have any comments, suggestions, alternate speeches? Amazing how a little baby just can pick his own mouth. Yes, that's because that limbic system is online, many believe, in, in vitro, in, in the womb, or certainly at birth. There's, there's a lot of work that I've done with somatic experiencing that um, has indicated that people are having the sensations of what it was like if something went wrong during their birth. Like they're coming up with bodily activation patterns that there's no way they would have known unless you had. I what's your name? You. Tamara. Tamara, my name's Rick. Hi to see you. Hey, Good to see you. I, I was just wondering if there's a subtle difference between the <coughs> mom who doesn't have a blank face but who reacts differently or responds differently. So, in other words, the baby's sad and the mommy goes, oh, you're okay. And I wonder if what the subtle differences would be between the two. Well, that, yeah, that's, and I'm wondering if you're talking about incongruence yeah, when incongruence. there's an inappropriate response. Yeah, that, I believe, and I've seen discussions on this, is also as it can be damaging because now someone says, wow, not only am I, am I alone, I'm with someone who's threatening. Like, no one's, it's not that I would, maybe it's kind of better that no one be around because this person doesn't get me at all. And now what are they going to do? So it's a great question. Thank you. Or a comment, actually. So we have the automatic nervous system that wants to stay from it stay away from threat yet we need to attach to survive and we see where this comes from and how we attach at a very early age shapes how we're going to attach in adult relationships so I'm going to rip through this because I'm this is the attachment style we could spend a whole day just talking about how these are um, shaped and what to do with them usually couples are going to come in with one if they're securely attached they probably don't need therapy maybe some fine-tuning but usually what you're going to see is someone who's avoidant and they pick someone who's a wave. Or actually they wouldn't do the picking, the wave would do the picking and the chasing. So I'm going to quickly go over this. Basically securely attached is someone who had a lot of good caregiver experiences. And I'll just let you read that. Now this is important. Reading faces, voices, and deals with difficult people well. Because it doesn't seem so penetrative. Oh, sure. Thanks. I appreciate you sticking up for what you need there. So people who are anchors are people that come from a family where there's an emphasis on relationship. They have experienced justice, fairness, and sensitivity in their family. They love to collaborate and work with others, and they read faces, voices, and deal with difficult people well. They, they're attr they attract relationship. Got it? Cool. Thanks. So people who are waves tend to be, like in the list is much longer. I'm a wave, by the way. Uh, feel a great deal with their emotions. They have a strong attachment in childhood, but they were inconsistent. They have helped soothe a parent or both parents who were overwhelmed. You know, be, they got parentified. That's um, God, an example would be like a mom says, the child says, I'm going to go play baseball. Oh, you're going to leave me here all alone? So whew, shutting down impulses in order to serve your caregiver. Otherwise, if your caregiver isn't taken care of, you don't get lunch or you don't get a house to live in. Um, have felt rejected, turned away by one or both partners, focus on external regulation, asking others to help soothe them because they were so used to doing it for others. And they find it's hard to shift from interacting to being alone. They overexpress and like to talk about all the details. Notice, notice, chat, chat, chat. <laughs> and I didn't have any coffee today. <laughs> um, stay in close physical contact to others. I love to snuggle. Often think they are too much and nobody can tolerate them. Yep and also known as anxious preoccupied. This comes from a Mary Main and attachment studies. And, she'll and so avoidant is a person who's learned to self-soothe way too early. They're just, they're expected to kind of raise themselves in their home that they came from. They like to be alone and they own their, enjoy their own space, have been raised to be self-sufficient and tend to avoid people. They learn early on not to depend on people, often feel crowded in intimate relationships. They be, they in a, they're in a world of their own, self-soothe and self-stimulate. They do not turn to others for soothing or stimulation, and that's extra. We see that a lot here because we deal with a lot of porn and sex addiction, and so what better way but to self-soothe with a screen and images. Um, find it hard to shift from being alone to interacting, underexpress their thoughts and feelings, and process a lot internally. So um, one of the things that Tatkin says so brilliant, and he says, these type of people say, I like you in my house, 
but not in my room except at my invitation. And that kind of sums it up. And if you have ever gone into a relationship with an avoidant, it might be something like they'll be in their room on the computer and they get really startled if you say, hey, dinner's ready. They don't like something coming in to puncture their, their um, system. So we got these nervous systems that want to keep us alive, and yet there's a part of us that sees something familiar. So if we were, if we're an island, we're going to see something familiar in the wave. We're going to see something. The wave's going to see something familiar in the island. And it's it's an interesting thing as someone becomes more and more dependent on each other. They're going to want to say, "Hey, stay away. Oh wait, don't go away." And it creates a sense of um, frustration. A little too complicated to talk about right now, but I'll do my best. So arousal. This is probably what you'd want to get from this lecture the most, which is. Let me just check the time here. We're going to end at 1, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'll leave some room for questions. Arousal is probably what gets us the most as therapists because knowing that we're interpersonal beings, meaning that the field that we're in affects the field, uh, uh, affects our own sense of well being, and we can also give that effect to others. It's so important for us to stay regulated so we can watch the regulation in our couples. And that's usually what gets them into trouble. And it's going to fall. Nope. Gravity's good in here. <laughs> so if we react to threat in primary relationships with a fight, flight, or freeze response, those reactions can be threatening and erode security in relationships. And if couples agree to get to know each other's primitive systems, walk them through some of this stuff, respect attachment adaptations. Hey, you know what? You're a wave. OK, you know what? We're going to talk about our relationship right when I'm trying to go to sleep. Um, and you're an avoid. You're an avoidance so I won't yell dinner's ready from the other room and I don't have to make it personal when you don't respond to me in the way that I'm used to if people know their attachment adaptations and if they can manage each other's arousal they'll have a better relationship that's one of the hopes that I have for you guys is that you get these tools so what helps personally as a therapist really important whatever you're going to do with your couples or individuals for that matter know what your stance is know where you're going so you can sort of be a, a shining beacon for the clients who are going to need a little parenting in session. And so if you know where you're going, that's going to help you stay regulated. Now, personally, taking a stance for secure functioning has been so helpful for me. And in some respects, I get a little too cocky in session because I'm thinking, hey, I know how this works. Come on, let's just do this. All you have to do is just start committing to each other, and I'll go down a whole list of stuff. Nah, too, too left brain for some, but we get to that. Um, secure functioning strategies help couples manage the insecure attachment adaptations in the limbic natural unconscious responses and it's going to help them um, mitigate that and that's where we start talking about interpersonal fields and co-regulation they're going to they're going to co-regulate each other we're going to teach couples to be their own best therapists listen to that for a second we want to teach our couples to be their own best therapists. What do we do as therapists? Anybody want to like, venture a guess on what you think your most enjoyable thing is with a client? What do you do best with your clients? Please throw anything out if you like. Help them let them know that you, know, you see their point of view. OK. You listen. Yeah. Uh huh. They, so someone feels heard, in other words. Anybody else? Accept. 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 Mm. So you just you stay present with it in a way, like, okay, just not try to change it or push it back or say there's something wrong with it? Okay. Maybe make, I'm make a note. What's that? Maybe unconscious conscious. Ah, okay. Can I riff on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. To make the unconscious conscious. One of the things I'd say is the unconscious doesn't want to poke its head out too often unless it feels safe. And one of the things that I imagine you do just by saying that is by saying, I want to make it safe enough for the unconscious to come out. And that's what I encourage couples to do for each other, that it's a no-fault environment. We want to teach couples that it's not about who said what, where, and how, and who's going to win this, it's sort of like that jury room thing. But it's a no-fault. Hey, I know you're doing the best you can. I'm doing the best I can. I'll tell you what, where we've missed, and we'll try to get it going again. We'll try to figure it out. But Tadkin talks about how if we could help couples do conflict in a playful way, think of it being on like a play mat, that you have this rubberized mat, and kids 
tend to wrestle around on that and it's rough and tumble so can you make conflict fun that you know you know what I'm really upset about this God you look beautiful today and you're being a real big pain in the ass and you want to go get some pizza that you stay in the mat that if, if a kid falls out the mat hits his head or something then it's, and that's not playful anymore and it hurts and people start to cry so the idea is can we always stay tethered and not threaten the relationship I'll get to that more so if you wouldn't mind, take out your smartphones. I imagine everybody has their phone here with them today. So I don't even know why I call it a phone. It's really like a computer. I want to thank Diane Poole Heller. She's got this mastermind program for therapists that she's doing on the internet. It's pretty cool. I definitely invite you to check it out. I saw this intervention. What's her name? Diane Poole Heller. Um, Diane is D-I-A-N-E, Pool P-O-O-L-E, and then Heller, H-E-L-L-E-R. She's a very experienced, she comes from the somatic background, and she's providing a community for therapists to really stay tethered because the Internet's making it more available for us. If we, like, think of all the stuff you had to do to get here today. Imagine sitting at home, it's kind of less interpersonal, and I'm enjoying your company, but if we can't get here for some reason, at least you've got some other community of therapists that you can connect with. So you got your phone, you got your smartphones out. Notice, look at it for a moment and hold it. I'll hold mine too. Actually, I don't want to hold it yet. Um, think about what it represents. This is like a portal to other connections, other people. I'm imagining that you guys use it to stay connected with the, with other people in your life that are important. Now give that to someone sitting next to you. I'm hearing laughter again. <laughs> Notice that. Notice if there's anything showing up for you. Again, the automatic brain doing its thing, saying, uh-oh, something might be going on here that could be threatening. I'm going to say threatening or just questionable or what's next? What's he gonna, is he going to bring a bucket of water and we're going to throw these all in the phone, phones in the water? No, I won't do that. All right, get your phones back. Get your portal back to all your loved ones. And notice, notice if anything's settling. Yeah, see that? It's all happening without your permission. There you go. Aww. Cozy, cozy. Oh, <laughs> separation experience, I heard someone say. So I'm up here hoping that you guys get the message that if we can get in with our couples and start talking about secure functioning, not everybody has to stay, not everybody has to be tethered. You get to let them make that decision. And if they're into it, great. And then you get, you get their ear. You can explain to them what it's about. Now, John Gottman and his uh, approach to therapy, he has that underlying message, will you be there for me? Uh, Sue Johnson, everybody needs a hand to hold. Tatkin's point is, can we hold hands in hell? That's that, <laughs> that's that fair fighting thing, that we will have conflict because there's going to be conflict. Can we do it in a way that isn't threatening? So I'm going to ask you, perhaps you will take a stand for secure functioning. These shirts are on sale after the program. So how do you promote it with your couples? Well, you're going to ask them about it. You're going to ask them, what do you want your relationship to be about? Because they're coming to you for a reason. They're spending money, hopefully, and because I want you guys to be in business. And so you're, if you're alive, you can serve others um, or trading. But if they get to answer the question that they may have never been asked before. What do you want your relationship to be about? It's an adult choice. It's not a, um, something that's just going to fall together. It might fall apart automatically, but relationships take intention. And this is the thing where I think it's a great wake-up call to ask couples. They realize, look, if you're basing your relationship on attraction or circumstances that aren't um, taking into account that people are burdensome like we all gonna get old we're all gonna lose our attraction at some point you want to start having them question like what are we gonna do for each other that's unique what are we going to do when the things that would normally just keep us sort of interested and hungry fade or change what do we want to do and that would be basing your relationship more on um, principles instead of feelings so, this will be a long read. Partners are, here's the, here's the hallmark of a securely functioning relationship. Partners are in each other's care. 
They are each other's go-to person. The relationship comes first. It's good for me and it's good for you. Mutuality trumps autonomy. The relationship is protected in public and private. Partners have each other's owner's manual and can change their partner's state. Oh, I wish I had more time for that one because that's where you influence. Like, We all kind of naturally gravitate towards what works for us, but taking in an extra step of like, hey, well, when you come home from work, maybe you don't um, want it to be engaged with for the first 10 minutes, but that's what I want, so I'm going to do that for you. But you want to learn little ways that say, I'm going to be in service of your system. Why? Because we have an agreement. Because when I do that for you, I know that you'll do it for me when I'm in a different cycle than you are. Partners are in each, each other's go-to person. Mentioned that. Partners manage thirds well. Probably the biggest thing that hurts couples is thirds. Think of a dyad, two people. Well, if a third, a third can be anything. It can be golf. It can be another person. It can be work. It can be anything that takes attention away from two people being in service of each other. Partners, partners fight fair. Hmm? Animals. Oh, my goodness, yes. Oh, come here, Fluffy. Well, wait, where's my hug? <laughs> so this is, this is so important, and this is what we introduce to the couples for them to consider, that you guys are in a situation and you don't know how to get out of it, but what if you base your relationships on purpose and principle, not what your feelings are? Hey, hey, you know, you came home and you yelled at me for not cleaning up the kitchen. We don't do that. We don't yell at each other. Why? Because it's activating for our system. And, and how maybe you get a feel for that. Th this is kind of what we don't do. So it's not just about listening. That says, if you can't read in the back, that's just the booze listening. If partners perceive benefits from secure functioning strategies, this is again me selling to you the idea that if you pick up secure functioning strategies for your own way of handling couples, it's going to be easier to sell it to them when it comes to conflict management. So, let's see what. Wait a second. Oh. Hey, buddy, can you get a court for Saturday after 3 o'clock? <laughs> All right, I'm not really using my phone. But I wanted you to notice that because I turned my attention away from you. And we're not even in a primary attachment relationship. And something felt probably off for you. So many people are turning to screens these days, and especially with the availability of things that trigger dopamine, like uh, pornographic images and things that promise um, instant relief, things that you can shop for, things that are um, somehow captivating for our nervous system. Like there's a lot of stuff going on, people putting up pictures of car accidents and things like that. That's hard to compete with, and you want to make sure that's part of your agreement. The biggest thing that's out there is how to manage thirds. We want to really help couples start taking seriously that if someone's out golfing too much, that's a third. If someone loves talking to their mother every day, you want to check with the client. Say, well, how's that work out for you? And you encourage this idea, wait a second, take care of me. And that's our agreement. We take care of each other. Ah, great, great question. Because here's what I'd say, and what I've seen happen well, is that children are very, very important. But keep in mind, if children are in a home where the, I'm going to call it the king and the queen, because it's, it's a heteronormative statement, but the king and the queen of the household have their organization, the entire household does better. Think of the, think of the, the functioning couple as the roof in the house. And if the roof is in, intact, then everybody gets protected. And so if, I'd, I'd say the kids, of course, you don't, imagine, picture this, a couple comes together, someone comes home and the other person meets them. The first thing that anyone wants to do is get in there, the dogs, the cats, the kids. But separation reunions are so important and I'd say teach your couples to do well for each other first. Energize, synchronize, let each other know you're there and then the kids can come in. So I, does that seem to address it? Yeah. It's, it's, you don't put them so aside but you don't... The, the, the kids from becoming a third. 
sort of like so you're providing the attachment for them, but then if we if they become a third, then that's going to be damaging. In other words, yes. And here's here's a great example of how that could be damaging. So. Very often, because our amygdala is listening for loud noises, I could say, it's a beautiful day out there, isn't it? God, the sky was blue. Feel your energy like, oh, what's he doing? This is so uncomfortable. But I'm saying something nice. Very often when kids in conflict occur in a home and one parent's trying to manage that, it sounds like a siren going off to the other, uh, to the other caregiver. And very often a big mistake is made is that other caregiver will come in and say, like, if I could use you guys as an example, let's say this is your daughter, and, and it's, it's like, let me handle this, and now I'm dealing with the daughter. That is very destructive. That's a misuse of a third. Instead, if I went up to you and say, honey, good job. Is there anything you need? And we stay connected in, for the service of providing a structure for the child. It's much more along the lines of a secure functioning relationship. I hope that makes sense. Um, so... They manage thirds well. They don't threaten the relationship. Well, I think I love you. <laughs> you know, we'll see. It's like, ouch. The, 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 the first thing that your brain so, says is, oh, threat. And then we don't, we don't operate well under threat. Eye contact, so important. Real-time eye contact. <sighs> Would you all put your fingers out like that? If you have thumbs, put them in front of you. See your thumbnail? That's about how much detail your eye can handle in terms of precision detail. That's where you read. That's where you see things. The rest outside that, this is called the fovea, the, air, the, the cone of attention. Everything else is pretty much, some people would say, legally blind. And so the rest of that area is used for threat detection. Uh, eye conscious is really important. If you're driving somewhere and someone's sitting here, hey, you know what, I really don't like you how you handled the, the payment last month on the mortgage. Well two things are happening. There's a tone of voice and there's a threat detection system now operating on the peripheral side of our vision. So don't have hard conversations without being able to look in someone's eyes and see what their state is. Because coming back to arousal regulation, our job is to make sure that if someone, that our partner is heating up, our first and foremost job is to say, I'm sorry. Let's bring that down. Short bursts, things that too much explanation requires the top outer layer of the brain, this cortex, where all the thinking is. That's where all our thoughts are. So that's like a two or three um, inch long sentence. Uh, Sweetie, I'm sorry. I, uh, I forgot to pay the mortgage because, you know, right as I was going out the door, I didn't have stamps. And then the envelope, I wasn't sure whether it would fit. And, you know, that, and meanwhile, the pressure is rising. Instead of, I'm sorry, I let you down. These short bursts can get in before and much faster and bring this down. That, and that is where couples start talking about um, that would be fair, fast, fair fighting and fast repair. Is that whoever's in distress wins. Whoever complains first gets the attention. Now, if you're noticing anything happening, like, well, what if they always complain? Chances are if someone's always complaining, you haven't learned their owner's manual yet. And that's what we want to teach couples is get it right faster. Uh, what else do we have here? <laughs> so yeah, that's a cute picture. And again, I think I made this point. I'm a little ahead of myself. But here's the, I think that one of the biggest threats as a third is this stuff going on, that people are just diving either into their work and their screens into their infotainment or into something that's destructive in terms of sexuality. I'm going to play something really quick here for you. Not so quick. We're going to find out. Oh, by the way, um, I'm going to leave some time for questions. So in case anything's on your mind, we'll have time for that. Enjoy that air, air, enjoy that air conditioning. Sorry about the heat, by the way. If this, if it, it feels hot to me, so I imagine, and I see some people fanning. So sorry about that. So another thing that's happening is people are using their devices to talk, 
and that breaks the eye contact and you can't really get um, a sense of what's going on at the underlying systems. Uh, buffered some of the There we go. And it's exciting to be out, always exciting to be out in the world, isn't it? Not home, just out there floating around. But I know you got your phone. Everybody here's got their phone. It's not one person here that doesn't have it. You better have it. You got to have it. And we call it a phone. We don't really use it much as a phone, do we? No, we don't, because they gave us the option. Some years ago, you were given the option. Well, you want to communicate to another person. You could talk, you could type. Well, once you have that option, well, that took half a second. Talking lost. Talking's over. Who wants to talk? To talk? Oh my God! I gotta talk. Do I have to talk to this person now? Talking is work. You gotta make facial expressions that go with what you're saying. Different hand gestures. You gotta suck air in. You gotta blow it out. <laughs> talking is over. It's obsolete. It's antiquated. I, I feel like a blacksmith up here sometimes. To tell you the truth. <laughs> Email, text, we love it. Because when we communicate to another person, we want them to know, I could have called you and I chose not to. <laughs> I decided I only want to hear my half of the conversation. <laughs> this is what I have to say. I think we're done here. <laughs> you get it? It's like we've got these great tools to help be able to be efficient, but when it comes to dealing with these primitive brains of ours, you can really, and how many of us have said something one way and the person reads it, what? So be careful. You want to really let people hear that the relationship will be in the eyes. It will be in watching body patterns. It will be coming from the soma. So we covered a little bit of eye contact, um, fair fighting. The one per who perceives it wins. Like if someone feels hurt, hey, you know, that hurt. Well, I didn't mean to say that. That's door number one. What about, I'm oh, sorry. That takes strength for the person that they feel. How many of us have felt, you're out of your mind. I didn't do that. But if we can suppress that and say, oh, this person's in trouble. Their sympathetic nervous system is getting ready to fight, flight, or freeze. Do you want to be right or do you want to be, them to be happy? Because when they're happy, I'm happy. I'm sorry. What can I do to be better? Where are we going to go with that? Oh, I just did it. That was a short burst. Quick repair. So in conclusion, neuroscience. Our brains are fast and dumb. When threatened, which makes us fight. Attachment. How we attach in childhood will determine what we are sensitive to in adult relationships. Arousal. We can help couples manage arousal through secure functioning behavior. Having a therapeutic stance that supports secure function can inspire clients to manage each other's threat reflexes for the good of the relationship. And then I've got a, an example of how to manage some arousal. Oops. <laughs> And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. <laughs> yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just <laughs> pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. <laughs> See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. See, you're not listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just. Sometimes it's like there's this achy. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, my sweaters are 
snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! If you would just don't. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. Well, I, yeah. We've got like a, any questions, comments. Again, alternate presentations are welcome. So, um, any, any questions? Uh, a comment on one thing and a question on another thing. That um, going back to the um, still face experiment, one of the things that I found interesting about that is it adds um, more uh, devil in the details to Erickson's trust phase. It seems to me because we tend to think about the importance of that phase of life. Um, of a child feeling their needs are met in terms of are they when they cry do they get fed are they you know but it, it goes down to do I get a reaction from my mother's eyes you know mm -hmm. that that is part of what builds trust or mistrust even it seems and so it's like an extra you know finite level of how that plays out it seems to me Just so that lands for you in other words it because yeah. he talked about development way back but can does it seem reasonable for you to consider that, that those circuits are still alive and well no matter how old we are? Oh, of course. I mean, I, I see my cl my clients, I mean, trust issues, and my, my own, I mean, trust issues are forever. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, nobody gets through completely unscathed, in my view, through the trust phase. I mean, everybody has some degree of vulnerability to getting it re-triggered, and it strikes me as that's how that first year and a half or second year plays out in so many micro levels, mm -hmm. because it strikes me that, that is, that's a potential distrust signal for the baby to feel like, ah! <laughs> well, yeah, and so that would get, and that would get burned into a pattern. And one of the things that I, I found so helpful was that to start thinking and encouraging couples to think, hey, wait a second, what if, can anything up? No, you're good. Okay. Um, what if we actually said this to couples, would you consider that your relationship is about transformation? That you guys came together, now, notice this, I mean, check out your own relationships. Don't we pick <coughs> people and some people say, oh, my picker's broken. Well, hold on a second. It's working perfectly. You're picking someone who you need to work your shit out with, your stuff out with. It's like, come on. Isn't that a beautiful system that we have in us that we pick each other to evolve? Because think of survival of the species. If we had issues growing up and certain threats were handled a certain way, wouldn't we want to pick something familiar? Because those caregivers technically knew what to do to stay long, alive long enough in our environment to reproduce. So why wouldn't we want to stay sort of tight within our familiar clan and pick someone in a very neurologically survival, uh, a neurologically based survival picture and bring them in and then then upon, then upon noticing the discomfort, then you can say your couple of that's coming from the top down stuff. What do you want to do to transform the bottom up stuff? And then now the relationship has another layer of purpose other than bliss and her creation and the fun stuff that goes along with that. So that's that's what I'd say. Hey, encourage your couples to notice the transformation and tell me. Uh, you had a question. Go ahead, please. I'd rather hear what uh, you have to say than what I have to say. Uh, my question was just: You said you work with a lot of high conflict couples. Mm -hmm. When they first come in, um, you know, so this is all the material that you're thinking of. You know, that you're holding. Um, what do you? Yes, <laughs> right. So, so what are those first sessions like? What do you tend to do when they first come in and they have like a flurry of? Mm -hmm. Love like that question. Because what happens for me is my anxiety. Look, you can hear the pace of my voice. I'm just a highly anxious person generally. But it's the biggest chore for me to sit back and watch the movie. And I am fortunately seeing Stan's work and other people who are pretty confident. You just sit back and watch. And you can say stuff like, God, you guys really don't know how to take care of each other, do you? You start planting seeds. It may, may feel a little shameful. But they're there for a reason, which means there's a kernel of hope, as Gottman would say that inside every conflict, something's going to evolve better. And so to answer your question, what do I do? I sit on my mat. I try to do this and watch the movie until something shows up. And I think, oh, OK, that's what's that's what, I'll feel an inspiration. And then I'll come back to the secure principle. So what aren't they saying to each other that should be said? And then how do I position them to feel a desire and somehow to do that for each other, which would then go into cross-questioning. Does he always talk like this? I'll point, this is all of Tatkin's work. 
you, you don't say, hey, do you always treat um, her like that? You say, does he always talk like this? And you know, hey, what do you like about her? You start making the couple, and first, and also have the couple face each other. It's, it's because that takes care of the phobia, and that takes care of them staying out of implicit memory. Um, I feel like the question's answered, because I want to riff on something real quick. Yes, yeah, go Okay. Eye contact is important because it keeps you in the moment. If couples, do, if I do this, so you know, I'm in this audience now, I'm giving this lecture, and a lot of these people don't, you know, I'm just not sure if I can trust some of this information. So, I'm not sure this lecture's gonna go the way I want it to. See, I'm in my own head, but if I look at you, I see these joyful faces, say, oh wow, there's a lot of recognition in here. Things are great right now. If couples are fighting and you see them start to not look at each, you know that they're going back to past injuries, whether it was done by each other or someone else. And so it's really important, even in, in the fights that I have in my primary relationship, it's like, I'll say, sweetie, look, wait, look at me, look at me. Is, do, is, do you see something on my face that's threatening right now? Do you see something going on that, that tells you that you're sure this is what I intended to do? To try to do a cross check with what's happening now, the top <coughs> down versus the bottom up. Keep in mind, our brain is designed for novelty. We like looking for new things, and we need to push that aside as fast as possible so we make room for new, new things that might kill us. So you guys, for those of you who drove today, you did not drive your car the same way than you did when you were 16 learning to drive. Why? Because it went into automatic procedural memory. That's how we've survived. So couples tend to come out of primary, they come out of procedural memory automatically when threatened, and we've got to keep them in the moment. What do you see on his face that's threatening would be an intervention. Would you be okay if you gently, if she gently touched you right where she sees anger? And that forces them to start cross-checking the memory of the past of perhaps an alcoholic father that was insult, um, you know, aggressive and attacking to someone that is showing up that's just a proxy. But oftentimes with these type of conflict couples, there there is a lot of anger on their faces when mm -hmm. they're talking to each other. So what do you do? So they are seeing a threat. It actually is there. So that you just see them fighting back and forth, they'll start yelling at each other or what? Uh, they'll be um, saying what's wrong with the other person, or you always this, or you never this, or you know, those kinds of things. Okay, so there's a couple ways to go about that, and at least that I've found success. One is you just wait. Or you do something that's actually insulting. Because if they're really at it, <laughs> so I, you're pretty much sending the message that you get the guys down yet. Because that's gonna, they're gonna feel a sense of like, okay, that's also to test the therapeutic alliance. Because if I do that and they ignore me, and they just go and go, then they just want an audience, and they're not willing to think. I mean, I'm gonna, this is a projection, but I would say their brain isn't really ready to take in a professional. They don't think that they need the help. You know what? Fuck you. I'm just going to talk to her the way I want or him the way I want. And you get to be our audience and we pay you for that and that's fine. That might be like in a situation with a really highly um, charged narcissistic couple. Um, that's one intervention. If two people are way too angry and they're just not saying, oh God, at some point someone says, look, here we are again. And there's some sort of hint of humor or letting down. Then I would go into more of an EFT approach, the Sue Johnson technique, which is you triangulate which is, you say, hold on, hold on a second. So what's like, what's going on right now? Tell me what it's like. And you bring them back to their experience versus what their partner did. Well, he said this, he says, yeah, well, what goes on for you when that happens? And you avoid the, you cut off this escape path of, let me label why I'm miserable because of their behavior. You just let them talk about what mm -hmm. it's like to be able, eventually it's gonna come down to, I'm alone, or I don't trust them, or I'm hurt. Is negative. We're, we're negative. Our brains are negatively biased. I'm sorry to say, because that's what kept us alive. You know, we can't mistake a tiger for a rock, but we can mistake, mistake a rock for a tiger. Please. I, I find the, diffi the most difficult couples are those who just, you know, they, you know, they hear the partner saying, "I'm alone. I'm scared. I'm frightened," but they lack the capacity for empathy or much insight. Mm -hmm. So, what do you do in these couples where they just don't? They can't. They have extreme difficulty. Doing Why are that. you guys together? Why did you pick each other? What's because going on? she because she cooks me dinner and does my washing. Okay, and that's it. You could outsource that. Again, sex. 
Okay, you can outsource that too. Why? What's unique about you guys being together? Uh, is it okay we roleplay a little yeah, bit? Yeah. So what's unique about um, each other that you guys do for each other that no one else on the planet wants to do? She takes care of me. Mm. And do you know if that works for her? Hmm? Does that work for her? It should. Well, how about we check? Does it work? And now you can switch roles. Is it working for you? Ask, ask her. Is it working for her? No, because he, had, he, he doesn't... I don't feel like he really cares or understands me. Well, so it sounds like you're getting what you need, but she isn't. What do you think will happen with that? What? What do you think will happen if... Because she's telling you right now that I wouldn't necessarily engage. I'd have him reflect what it was. That, so did you hear what she just said? What did you yeah, hear? Yeah, but that's a wife's obligation and duty. Well, it sounds like she's not really feeling taken care of, and if you don't take care of her, someone else will come along and do it for you. I'd throw in a little threat of, like, um, if you don't take care of each other, then what's the reason to stay together? Now, there's other pressures that tend to show up, and these are a little harder to detect, but what if there's financial duress? Some people can't just up and leave yes. their relationship. Sometimes there's children. That's where you want to bring that overt, le uh, overtly into the room. We're like, well, what if she's just here because you pay the bills? Would that be okay with you? Mm. And is that what's going on? Always push it back into the diet because here's the, there's a couple's therapist credo that Tatton came up with. It's brilliant because we can get dysregulated wanting to fix the relationship. But you say this, I'm their couple's therapist. These people picked each other. Whether they stay together or not is not my concern. My job is to point them all to secure functioning. These people picked each other. I'm the couple's <laughs> therapist. Whether they stay together or not is not my concern. I just give them the tools to make a choice for secure relationship and do the best I can at promoting that. And so, um, yeah, that, that was a tough one though. Let me acknowledge that. that, that that's tough when someone's I mean, just stonewalling. I mean, if you've got someone with even the slightest bit of empathy, it's like, no worries. But that's what, where I found like, yeah. okay, this is really hard. Yes, and what you can do also, you can crack the psyche a little bit because part of the, the couple's approach, the psychobiological approach to couples therapy is you do what's called a partner's attachment inventory, which is you actually have two people face each other, but you ask them detailed questions about their childhood in a row. Like, who did you go to for a hug? Like, if you guys were partners, I'd have you face each other, and then I'd just say, so, so who did you go to for a hug? Um, when you were in trouble or in pain, who soothed you? Who put you to bed at night? Who had a bedtime <coughs> ritual? Name three to five things that would describe your relationship with your father. Mm -hmm. You thrive things. The other person's listening, and all of a sudden things are clicking. Oh my God, that's why they don't put the cat back on the toothpaste because they didn't have toothpaste. You know, it's, there's all these little things, and you start to weave the unconscious, invisible paths that have these two people choose each other into the present, and then it makes it less personal. You know, what, I'm not going to yell at you ever again for leaving the cap off the toothpaste. God bless you for appreciating it now. You know, thank you. It turns something that would be mysterious or painful into more of like, oh. I care for her when I put the lid on myself. I mean, the other thing that I find challenging is if one partner brings in the other and says, and it's basically, she's the problem, fix her, I'm fine, I'm good. If only she were doing X, Y, and Z, very hard to take any kind of responsibility for their part. Mm. God, what is it like for her to hear that? I would, imp I would try to improve the theory of mind in the person who's being the aggressor. That makes sense. Like, like okay, so, but, and, and I'd actually say something um, about like, well, I'm kind of parachuting in your life, but you guys are going home together. Is is this what it's like at home? Almost showing a look on my face. Um, this this reminds me of the example of two siblings in a home without a parent, and the two siblings are the are just running the show. And they're, they're being unfair, unjust, insensitive to each other too much of the time. And so what I'd want to be is the parent that comes in and says, that's not how we treat each other. Let me give you an example of how you should behave if you want this relationship to continue. Because this is what long-term couples do for each other. Once you're past the, the 90 days of oxytocin and vasopressin and testosterone. 
So I'm hoping, I see you yeah. nodding, I'm hoping yeah. that you... Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you. In the case of the non-empathetic partner um, that uh, is really brought up, um, what would you think of exploring with that partner um, what they are empathetic toward and seeing what that fleshes out in terms of exploring their empathies in the world that maybe are um, more able to connect with the partner than they are realizing? I might go that route if I felt there was a organic deficit, like maybe or someone with uh, Asperger's conditions or some sort of brain injury where there's a part of their brain that's just shut off from being attuned. Um, but I'd still be more tempted to keep coming back to the personal stuff, like why are you guys together? You're two people in a room and you're paying someone to help do something for you. What is it? Why are you here? I'd still want to find the, the buy-in, the therapeutic alliance between each other that I could amplify. I hope that makes sense. Like, yeah, we could go for things. And then if, if someone had an organic deficiency, thanks for coming. Thank you. If someone had a, um, a deficiency, I'd say very clearly, let's map out what that is so the other partner knows what they're getting involved with. And then say, maybe that's enough for you. But at least now it's on the surface. And you, do, and you stop getting angry at someone who doesn't think to kiss you goodbye in the morning because they just don't have the capacity. Mm -hmm. What's great about this model is instead of it being conflictual, it's a capacity model. Again, coming back to this idea that it's a no-fault situation. We're all doing the best we can all the time. Can we have each other notice what the deficits are, not be mean to each other over it, and help each other overcome those deficits because it's what we do for each other based on our agreements, not on our feelings. Mm -hmm. So. We've got five minutes left. I don't mind ending here unless you guys have more to talk about. So I really, really appreciate everything you did to be here today and give me all your attention. Yeah.